legendary lives of two trailblazing women, cosmetics entrepreneurs Helena Rubinstein and Elizabeth Arden. When the show opened on Broadway recently, it was hailed as nothing short of flawless by Entertainment Weekly. The Hollywood Reporter raved, I died and went to musical theater heaven. How many people here have seen the show? That's like a 99% return. That's very good. Well, today, Ghostlight Records is releasing the original Broadway cast recording of the score that New York Magazine calls as good as Broadway gets. Um, Warpaint reunites Scott Frankel and Michael Corey, the acclaimed composer and lyricist team of several musicals, including Great Gardens, for which they were nominated for Tony, Drama Desk, and Outer Critics mm -hmm. Circle Awards. And to celebrate the launch of the Warpaint CD, we are thrilled to have its composer here to chat with the show's leading ladies, who will then Love sign it. your CDs. Um, now, I know a lot of you were already here for the early announcements. Um, we were very grateful that Patty was able to make it today. She's um, having some trouble today. She's in a lot of pain. If there are any doctors in the house that have some really good drugs or whatever, just, you know, don't be afraid to speak up. But um, it's, it's kind of difficult for her to sit, so if she all of a sudden pops up in the middle of the program and starts walking around, um, you know, she's not coming for you. It's just, you know, okay? So let's please give a warm welcome to composer Scott Frankel and two-time Tony Award winners, Patti LuPone and Christina Music for War Paint, and I'm so happy. Thank you. Really happy to be here at this Bastille Day with my two favorite non-French actresses. <laughs> Although, Patty, you, you sing some French stuff sometimes in your cabaret act, yes? Yes, I think I was in France on Bastille Day, which is a lot of fun. Well, you can't get more French than that. <laughs> Christine, any French? No. I went off on a tangent and we haven't even really gotten that far into it. Uh, I, uh, from Stephen's uh, show of hands, it seems like most of you have, who have seen, uh, have seen the show, but for those who haven't, uh, War Paint is a musical uh, that investigates the famous rivalry between uh, two cosmetics entrepreneurs uh, in the earlier part of the 20th century. Uh, Christine plays uh, Elizabeth Arden and Patty plays Helena Rubinstein. Uh, the urban legend is that the two women never met, which seems almost impossible to uh, cotton to since they had salons in Manhattan around the corner from each other for about 40 or 50 years. <laughs> but uh, there was great antipathy between the two women and uh, uh, so much so that, that uh, it, each woman wouldn't call the other one by their name. Uh, one, uh, uh, Arden called Rubenstein that dreadful woman. <laughs> and Rubenstein called Arden the other one. <laughs> uh, Patty and Christine, you uh, have known each other for many, many, many years in the show business in Manhattan, but you had never worked together before. Tell me what that was like playing two women, two women who had never worked together, uh, playing two women who had never met. <laughs> Thoughts? Uh, it's pure ecstatic joy to be working with Christine. It is, I have a sister on stage, and that's all that I think an actor wants, is to have someone that that you can trust, that you uh, know is will have your back, that will allow you to do anything, and they'll respond, do you know what I mean, in kind. And it's, I could cry, because I'm so happy on stage with <laughs> our cast, and especially my yeah. leading lady. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. I feel the same. and. I was thinking the other day, um, you know, just how what great admiration I have for Patty and great respect and just love her so much that in a way it's almost like we are fulfilling for Elizabeth Arden and Helena Rubenstein what they weren't able to do in their lives because I'm sure if they did get together they would probably really, really like each other, 
You know, I mean, they were, and they had so much in common that there was a real, I think there was a common bond that they shared, even though they weren't able to do it in person. It's so. a really interesting point. I think they, as a society, uh, certainly during the time in the earlier part of the 20th century when Rubenstein and Arden were in their heyday, there was an expectation that women were to be at each other's throats. And to a certain degree, that kind of catfight notion still exists, I think, in, in society today, and how wonderful that uh, it's actually, I mean, maybe it's less dramatic, but to find that these two have a mutual admiration society rather than plotting each other's downfall in the wings. <laughs> it certainly made for a much happier experience for me. I have gray hair, otherwise I would have no hair. <laughs> uh, there was a wonderful uh, show at the Jewish Museum several years ago that, uh, I don't know if anybody saw it, that, that it had a lot of Rubenstein's uh, incredible uh, jewelry and art, and she collected African art, and she was also, um, she, she fancied herself being painted by every significant contemporary artist. Uh, and there's a song in the show called Forever Beautiful, which I hope you will uh, enjoy. <laughs> on the cast recording as much as I do. And uh, Patty, do you want to talk a little bit about Forever Beautiful and uh, what that's like and what it's about in terms of uh, immortality or the legacy? Mm -hmm. I guess, um, you know, it's hard for me to talk about the show because I'm still discovering, do you know what I mean? Or, or like Helena, I'm still discovering every night that this is one of the things I love about a long run is the fact that you can continue to grow in the part, you can deepen the part and edit. Um, so I'm not removed enough from it to really be articulate about the song, except that I think the key line is when she's describing what the artists can do with these portraits, they can stop time. And I think that, and she then says, "What? tell me what face time can do that, mine, hers, no. So I think it's, it's about her desire to uh, remain immortal. And these um, portraits, Live on, actually. I mean, that is, in particular, when you think about live theater, too, which is lightning in a bottle, and it's, you, you know, you, yes, you could film it, but it's never really quite the same. I mean, there are certain things that are evanescent like that, like, that, 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 are, that are fleeting, and then when you, and then there are other things that are, that are forever, like an oil painting, or perhaps like a cast recording, as the thing, things that are permanent, things that are not, uh, that cannot float away on their own uh, accord. Uh, you know, it's interesting, with, with two, uh, uh, leading ladies playing two powerful, charismatic women. The show presented some structural challenges uh, for the authors. For instance, two big opening numbers where we meet you both in, in different locales. First, uh, we, uh, we meet uh, Christine uh, behind the famous red door, uh, at the top of a, a pink staircase, uh, which certainly satisfied a lot of my gay fantasies. <laughs> Uh, and then we soon meet Patty uh, barreling down the gangplank of an, o uh, an ocean uh, liner. Uh, but then there are two 11 o'clock numbers, and we talked a little bit about uh, Patty's, uh, which is forever beautiful. Uh, Christine has an 11 o'clock number as well, and it's called Pink. Yeah. Uh, and you know, it's interesting, it's, it's, um, throughout the whole show, it's a color that Elizabeth Arden was very famously associated with. She was a genius for branding and packaging in particular. So the, 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 the presentation of the, of the cosmetics in exquisite pink boxes with the most exquisite pink crepe paper and pink ribbons. Uh, and the 11 o'clock number uh, actually also, uh, Arden later in her life, uh, starts to um, wonder about what her legacy will be and, and, and talks about whether, it, whether that notion is is pink a frivolous? Is it a frivolous thing? Is it a frivolous color? Is it is it really something that you want to be known for? Um, any thoughts, Christine, about your? Does everybody know why eleven o'clock numbers are called eleven o'clock numbers? Yeah. Yes. I don't. Okay. <laughs> I didn't either. But in the old days, the theater used Monville, to, the right? theater used to start at eight thirty p.m. So it was around eleven o'clock p.m. when you would get your. Uh, you know your big ballad, or your big or Rosa's turn, or whatever the whatever your whatever your big heightened baffo moment is. What I did for love, it's an eleven o'clock number. Uh, but that but it, but it used to happen around eleven o'clock, and now the equivalent would be around 
around 10.30 or, or 10.20. 10.20 number doesn't sound as sexy, does it? I don't think that's gonna catch on. What, didn't it have something to do with vaudeville too? That they would put the most important players at 11 o'clock? Oh, interesting. Wow, thank I remember vaudeville very well. <laughs> Judy Garland and I. <laughs> no, that's not it. Christine, uh, Pink, the number, uh, as we wrote Forever Beautiful for Patty, we wrote uh, a Pink for you. Uh, what's it like going on that, uh, on that journey at the Nederland Theater at around 10, 20? <laughs> well, it's kind of like a, it's like its own play, really. I mean, it's kind of like an aria that just kind of runs the whole scope of her life. Um, it's really challenging and thrilling and um, I, I just really can't think of any greater gift to be given by Scott Frankel and Michael Corey really thank you uh, I wasn't I wasn't Christian for that presentation. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I think of Christina Patti as a, a Ferrari and a Maserati. You know, they can go slow, but what you really want to do is see them go fast. And it, the kind of wonderful thing for a writer, uh, for all the three of us, for Doug Wright, the book writer, and Michael Corey, my fantastic lyricist, and me, uh, you know, to give actresses, singing actresses, with the level of technical skill, the level of vocal acuity, the level of stage smarts and humor and pathos and energy and collaboration, you know, it, it, you, you start to think, what can't they do? But, it, but in playing two such rich characters, it was really important for us to give uh, uh, Patty and Christine material that, uh, you know, so I'm thrilled to hear Patty saying she's still finding things, material that that nurtures them or material that feels that they can continue to explore. I mean, that keeps that keeps shows alive in, in long runs in, in particular. You can still, I remember when I used to conduct shows on Broadway and you know, like you get to the 50th performance so you think, well, Jesus, how many other ways can I, you know, I tried it slow, I tried it fast, I tried it left. But, but, if the, but for actresses and actors, if they have material that they can, um, mold and manipulate and, and sculpt differently every night. And that also is a kind of a wonderful thing about live theater because the audience is different every night, I would think. And sometimes the composition of actors is different on stage with understudies, uh, that it isn't, it's literally never the same every night. So I love, I love uh, that alchemy. Um, do you guys uh, have any cabaret or concert appearances coming up in your non-existent spare time? Just curious. <laughs> I'm going to be at 54 Below. Uh, September, October, and November. And then the hospital. Uh, Are you going to go after the show or on the night off? It's on the night off. And with Larry, with the esteemed Larry Yurman, who is oh. the musical conductor of Grey Gardens and War Paint. So Larry and I, we have a show that we did at the Carlisle that we're going to be doing at 54 Below. So come by and see yes. us on Monday night, starting in September. It's so wonderful! <laughs> I saw it at Carlisle! <laughs> Wonderful. I, you know, it's interesting. I've seen I've seen Patty and Christine in concert situations a lot, and as well as their their stage work. But because they're uh, such fantastic instrumentalists, really, as well as vocalists, they're great musicians and they have great ears. It, it, it's it's so interesting to see to learn what they can do uh, outside of a book musical, where they're just essentially playing themselves, or where they or where they take a song. If Patty's singing a Kurt Vile song or, or, or Christine singing a Coward song, uh, when they can spin those songs, even though they're not tied to a, to a play, they can spin them almost like their little mini three-act musicals. And, I, and, that's a, and that's a very, very, very rare gift. I should say, I see in the back, uh, we're, I, you know, sometimes cast recordings, um, you know, you have to do them all in one day. 12 hours. It's a marathon. And uh, 
I see our incredibly uh, talented orchestrator Bruce Coughlin in the back, uh, who <laughs> whose arrangements and orchestrations on this are just a dream, and he makes our uh, our thirteen pieces sound like about uh, thirty. Uh, but I, I also should say that the producer of our uh, cast recording, Steve Epstein, did a marvelous job, and I hope you'll all uh, enjoy listening to it. Uh, it really does. Um, it really does evoke and capture the show that we do eight times a week at the Media Lander, but it also, I think, lives on its lives on its own. Now, didn't the New York Times say it was a must-have? <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. The New York Times said it was a must-have. But I have no buts. Uh, but. Well, they didn't say that about every show. Well, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Do you guys read the critics? Like, no. do they matter? Do you, do, does it yes. Yes. No. 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 Does it, do you, well, do you sometimes say, see something that someone didn't like and they go, and you think, well, I, 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 I disagree. Yes. Yes. That's good, you're not, you're not sheep. But do you let the critics affect your purchasing of a ticket to yes. a particular No. no. So that's the problem. No. No. And I think it's because the tickets are so expensive. If the tickets were seven, eight, 10, 15 bucks, it wouldn't matter what a critic said because you could still afford a ticket. But it does play into buying a ticket to a show if a critic says it stinks, which is a drag. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know because I think that um, the way the shows are marketed, the critics don't have the same kind of clout that they used to. Exactly. I mean, they used to be able to close the show. Well, that's true. And that's true. And with the internet out there, everybody can have an opinion. And you, you, you can pretty much find anyone's opinion. Well, to that point, Christine, we might be a must-have as far as the CD is concerned, but we have never been a critic's pick or a must-see in the New York Times for a theater this, that week, which pisses me off. <laughs> Well, who could this be uh, I said to Patty, I've clearly been sleeping with the wrong people all these years. But I knew that already. Well, I think, I think there's a way to market it so that we could create that logo a must see. Yeah, exactly. You who's, know to say, who's gonna say must see? You know, must see. Anybody can say it. David Merrick. And they do. And they do. But David Merrick used to take the bad reviews and put them up to get, you know, if, the, if one show got a bad. We, we could use all of that to our advantage, but I don't know. Who do we call? <laughs> our we, producers? We could take up David Merrick. <laughs> uh, uh, all by way of saying, we, we hope that you'll tell your friends to come see us at the Needle and the Theater. <laughs> I should also mention uh, uh, the show is based on two uh, nonfiction uh, sources. One is a wonderful joint biography of the two women called War Paint by Lindy Woodhead. Uh, another is a wonderful documentary film called The Powder and the Glory. Get it? Uh, and one of the filmmakers is here, and Carol Grossman in the front row. Wow. So if you have a hankering to you know even in even more depth than we can do in two and a half hours of the, the, the long and august lives of, of Helena Rubinstein and Elizabeth Arkin, you should check out either of those source materials, both of which I bet are available at Barnes and Noble. <laughs> it's interesting too, you know, uh, we the show is about powerful women. Uh, at our opening night, we had we when we did an auto time try it last summer in Chicago. I think we were all anticipating that we would be celebrating these two powerful women uh, against the backdrop of a, of a different kind of situation in Washington that ended up uh, turning out. Uh, and in some ways it provides an even greater tension, the fact that it didn't work out that way with the story about two powerful, wealthy, brilliant, successful protagonists and, and the sacrifices that they had to make being women in a so-called man's world how much of that has changed over the years and how much of it's still the same? You know, and I think that un unfortunately maybe too much of it is, is still, still the same. same. Still the same. I mean, didn't, who was the CEO that just left with the Yahoo and a replacement made three times as much as she did? Do you know what I mean? I mean, it's still the same. There may be incremental uh, advantages, but, but and, I think you know, and I'm always reading too that the Hollywood actresses are always making less than their male co-stars. Yeah, yeah. 
What's that about? Yeah, what is that about? Is it because males, is it the males? These are high class problems, aren't they? <laughs> That's true. I only made 15 million. We made 25. $25. I mean, it's the same thing because it's, it, it, it's all relative it's not. to your workplace, though. I think it's all relative to your workplace. I think that if there are women here that work, are, have a job comparable to a man and they are making less and they're only working in, I don't know, a supermarket or something, I think it still exists that women are for some reason uh, there is a song in the first act, uh, also on your cast recording, called If I'd Been a Man, yes. uh, appropriately yeah. enough. A, a duet that I'm very proud of, and uh, uh, it kind of um, uh, chews over a lot of these uh, these issues about sacrifices. And, and uh, you know, it's interesting, too. Uh, Patty and Christine have been absolutely fearless in terms of what they want to sing and how they want to sing it in terms of vocal production. Uh, uh, sometimes Christine is on the higher part and Patty's on the lower part. There are other times when we flip it and Patty's on the higher part and Christine's on the lower part. Uh, and that kind of fluidity and what that says about uh, parity between the two characters as well as the two actresses, it's really, um, it's really been fascinating to, to work on that way. And again, I think maybe it keeps everyone's muscles limber in different ways and, keep, and keep, so it's not, it's not just, you're not just singing across one narrow, uh, bandwidth. What else can I say? It's Bastille Day. Tell us about Bastille Day. <laughs> uh, no, honestly, what is it? Le 14 Juillet, the 14th of July. It celebrates the uprising of the Bastille. <laughs> I skipped ah. school that day. What was the uh, <laughs> They stormed the prison. They stormed the prison. It was the prison at the Place de la Bastille. Yeah. The prison was the Bastille. Was the Bastille. Oh, they stormed the prison? Yeah, this is going to be my next musical. It's going to be a little late Miz flavor, Bruce, maybe idea. some, maybe some, some, some accordion. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Patty and Christine for coming out. These two ladies, um, it's been the most thrilling, joyous, collaborative, fantastic process. Sometimes, sometimes you can have a horribly difficult process and a great show. Sometimes you can have a great process and a really boring show. This has been a thrilling, joyous, loving, and lovely process, and I hope it's resulted in a show uh, that you think, uh, as much as I do, has been a, a wonderfully uh, successful uh, and rich. And I do, uh, I do adore both of these two. I mean, what a treat for me to write for the two greatest singing actresses. I'm gonna say the two greatest actresses, period. We have one today.